Uh, this big wall here is a cross section. We've cut the cave right in half. And uh, with the elevations above, we can measure down exactly or, or anything down inside here. Now, actually, one of the things you see in this big cross section is you see the different layers, one on top of the other. Right here, all across here, why, uh, you've got a charcoal floor and burned rocks. And some of this charcoal we've taken out, we sent up to the laboratory and got an exact date on it. So we know this uh, is uh, 6600 BC, this layer right here. And uh, this used to be the floor of the, gr uh, of the cave right here, the level ground at the top of the earth. And on top of this floor, we found scraping planes, big scrapers, uh, grinding stones, some foodstuffs, mostly wild and so forth. And this is a, a layer, which we call Zone R, or Layer R, uh, which is characteristic of one of our earliest cultures in this cave, which we call El Riego, named after the oasis area up there. Now, after these people left here, wind blew in, rocks fell down from the top of the cave, and all this earth here piled up. Then, a thousand years later, somebody else came back in here. More earth piled up, somebody else came back in here. And, and these people, when they came back, were a different culture, one we call Coxcatlan. They had begun to domesticate corn, they had different kind of spear points, and they lived out when that, this was level of the whole cave. Now, uh, with this new agricultural group, with some incipient agriculture and some new tools, we began to have a rather rapid change. And this is what we need more, this is why we're still digging in Poron, because this is the culture we need more of. And uh, we have four or five floors, one on top of the other. And right now, we're digging over here uh, in zone N. Not here, of course, but if you follow zone N, or floor N, or layer N, but this old surface of the ground where the Coke Scotland people lived, oh, about 4,500 B.C., if you follow it around, well, you can see right where the boys are still digging out this layer and finding a little more stuff giving us a little more informa information about the Cook Scott Lawn. And it's coming out little by little. We're going to continue to work out more and more in this layer until we get a better sample and know a little more about these Cook Scott Lawn people because these are the ones who began agriculture for us. And if we uh, go up there, we can see them finding a little stuff. We're going to get something over there. I don't know what it is. But we'll bring, we have some more specialized tools we'll bring down here when we get to find something carefully. Yeah. Uh, well, this here is to got a point. Better measure it. Uh, medir. Yeah, medir. Medir. <laughs> that is. 22, uh, East 378, and 22 again from the state. 22, 22. Profundidad. 34. Punta. Punta. We've been digging up quite a lot of spear points like this one from this zone N, and uh, this may be quite helpful because it may allow us to date this layer and tell us what kind of people lived in it. Yeah, we've got, got the beginning of something here, a big object. Yeah, he has to come in. Yeah, well. Actually, the dirt's sort of hot, hard around the edge. We'll probably have to use a ice pick, which is our other thing. Since I don't want to, I don't know what, there might be some food stuff or something in it. Yeah. Grab a plenty of suck on it. Please, come in. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, come on. Now, again, take it out very gently with this spoon. Take off the dirt in there. Yeah, suck it to tear it Yeah. Beautiful. You often fi find the grinder right nearby. 
one thing I'm going to have to do is measure out. Time the end with you, yes, there must be a bell. I'm going to even go it a little bit into the next square in here. You'll crawl the socket at the time the end. Sometimes we take a photograph of it, but this is really not a sensational enough find. Yep. Nice, nice mono for grinding back and forth in the, in the matapti. And this one also. See it? In this matati, they probably ground up corn, nuts, and berries, or whatever foodstuffs they were trying to make into a meal. measured the same spot here, so I can take this out too. Yeah. Oh yes. Then just a picky yellow. No, that's picky. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is a this is a corn cob. And it's a real little one. Mengelsdorf will just love this. Get out of here. Archaeology is just digging. A lot of time is spent in studying and analyzing what we dig up. We usually take the things we dug up in bags, which are nicely labeled and recorded, bring them back into our laboratory in Tehuacan. Yeah, this, is the, this is a process that is endless on an archaeological expedition, but uh, everything we find after we dig it up as carefully as we can, why? Uh, has to be recorded in this large book. Uh, the little tickets we wrote on them out in the field are duplicated in the book and a number is given to the specimen. And uh, then, once the number is on the specimen, why, then we can start worrying about analyzing and studying the material. But the basic necessity in all this is so that we won't, after digging so hard and so carefully, that we won't mix up all, all our levels. Here's nice corn. And this is what we came for. This is the important stuff. And we've got all this stuff that goes to Mengelsdorf. And this is too valuable. I'll take this up in my briefcase when I go up by plane at the end of the summer. Now, beside all these materials, which they're numbering and so forth, we have some of our own experts right here. Now we can take this point and some of the stones 
to Miss Nelkin, one of our experts in the lab. Got a little point out of poor own K, his own M, so we'll see if we can date it and what we can find out about it. You got you got some other points, uh, the type collection ready? Sure. These, these, these are projector points why changed in styles, just like uh, uh, Model T changed into uh, V8s and so forth. Now this is the first one, and this is our, our Larimer point. This dates from before 7000 BC. Sometimes you find these sticking in mammoths, so this is a long time ago point. This is an El Riego point. This dates between 7,000 and 5,000 BC. This again is a big spear point, probably that jabbing kind. This is a nice little Coke Scott Lawn point. Very nice time marker. It dates between 5,000 and 3,000 BC. This is a Polona point. This dates 3,000 BC to 500 AD. And this is a Teotihuacan point. This is an arrow point this time. It's the only arrow point we got. And this lasts up to 1500 AD. Probably ended up occasionally in a Spaniard. Now let's take a look at our, our spear point. Now here's our, our spear point we dug up. And as you can see, it's nothing like the uh, Larimer point. No, no resemblance whatsoever to El Riego. There we are, almost bl brothers, or perhaps at least cousins anyway. And these last two, why, are not very similar at all. So here we have a pretty good fit. In other words, our zone in in P Puron Cave dates in terms of the style of projectile point somewhere between 3000 and 5000 BC. A very nice time marker, and this also tells us this is the Coke Scotland culture. These also are all susceptible of study. Here's our big grinding stone, and, and Tony again, with a microscope here, has looked at some of these uh, objects, particularly the interior, the used part. And uh, that, under the microscope, shows scratches and pounding marks, scratches round and round, and little pounding peck marks. And the funny thing is, is that this thing here shows exactly the same sort of marks in here. So whatever mark this and mark this, was, or these two are connected in terms of the motion there. These are for grinding up nuts and berries and for breaking up things. Now the other object here, and this object also, has grind marks back and forth. And these again seem connected back and forth like this. So we can guess that this thing was used back and forth like this, but actually we have a whole other set of information because both of these things, the pestles and the, and the mono and matati, are used right today by our workmen, by the, or by the wives of our workmen. We can go right out and see it, these tools still in use. And this, of course, is one of our best ways of interpreting our artifacts. As you see, here's our modern day uh, milling stone. And she's just exactly the same as our ancient one. The motion's the same. The style, of course, is different. And uh, what she's making here is she's grinding up little kernels of corn into a, what they call a masa, sort of a dough. And this can be used for any number of things. It can be made into little pancakes. It can be made into soup. And they made it as something they call tamales. Now, so we have one of our artifact types, as you see, still in use. And here's our other artifact. We so we thought we could see here. And sure enough, here's their chili grinder. A little pestle for beating it up, just exactly the same as our own pestle. And a little bowl this time made out of clay because it's much more modern. It's, after all, 7,000 years after this stone one. But it's the same thing, and there are little gr circular grinding motions in both of these. So here we have how we prove the, uh, these ancient tools were used a long time after, uh, a long time after they originally were used. So this uh, pretty much shows one of the ways we can interpret things.
Well, here's uh, some of our 7,000-year-old corn from Tewakan. Scully, the day I first saw this corn was one of the most exciting days in my life. I was convinced from the first time I looked at it that this is really wild corn. The first wild corn ever to be discovered. In the first place, it's quite uniform. You can see that these cobs, which are intact, are almost the same size. And this is characteristic of a wild species, to have uniformity. Also, these cobs are very fragile, yeah. which means that when they're ripe, they're easily broken. And so they have a means of dispersing or scattering their seeds. Then, too, this long chaff indicates that this was a kind of a, a pod corn. And the tiny seeds would suggest that it was also a popcorn. In fact, I think you've got pretty nearly what we had in our reconstructed ancestral form by crossing popcorn and podcorn. This produces tiny little ears in which the seeds are enclosed in chaff. And here's a reconstruction of, of, of this Tewakan wild corn, which Dr. Gallinat has made from these cobs that you brought back. And you see it compares quite closely with uh, our reconstructed ancestral form made by crossing podcorn and popcorn. This just looks like, that looks like a piece of grass. Well, it is a grass. It's a very unpromising grass for domestication. It's not much better as a subject for domestication than some of the weedy grasses of our lawns and garden. And well, another reason for believing it's wild corn is that when cultivation began in this valley, the corn changed. It became uh, quite a lot larger and it also became less uniform. This is typical of a cultivated plant. But it's still a long way from modern corn. The corn kept right on evolving. By the time the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century, it had reached a stage similar to several races which are still being grown by the Indians in Mexico. One of these, a brown seeded one, they call chapalote, and uh, another one uh, with reddish orange kernels, they call naltel. These are ever so much more productive than either the wild corn or their earliest cultivated corn. There is more food, I would guess, in a single kernel of some modern races of corn than there was in the entire ear of the Tewakan wild corn. It's an amazing uh, development, even in 7,000 years. We have seen that it was in the dry highland valleys of central Mexico where man first domesticated corn. Before Coscatlan times, the Indians of the Tehuacan Valley had to follow a nomadic way of life. They had to live on wild plant foods, such as nuts and berries, and they had to hunt wild animals. But after Coscatlan times, because corn had been tamed, they had enough food to settle in villages. They had time to develop the arts of settled life, such as pottery making, such as weaving of textiles on looms, such as the construction of temples. As the food supply grew, so did the population. And we find very early in Mexico, the growth of towns and eventually of cities, and finally of the great Indian civilizations that were seen and conquered by the Spaniards. 